Okay, does Australia need a plan B for its defence policy? It's a warm welcome to uh, Peter Jennings, PSM, who is the Executive Director of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, or ASPE, a position he's held uh, for the last seven years. Peter has extensive experience in uh, senior levels in the Australian Public Service on defence and national security. His career highlights include being the Deputy Secretary for Strategy in the De Department of Defence, Chief of Staff to the Minister for Defence and Senior Advisor of Strategic Policy to the Prime Minister. His research interests include Australian and regional defence policies, military operations, crisis management, government decision making and future defence capabilities. Since 2012, as, uh, as the Director of ASPE has expanded ASPE's role from research on defence to include research on cyber security, policing and international law enforcement, border security, national resilience and counter-terrorism studies. He, uh, he studied at the uh, London Business School uh, and was awarded a Master's of Science in Management with distinction. He has a Master of Arts degree in International Relations from ANU and a Bachelor of Arts in History, Honours, Honours History from the University of Tasmania. He was awarded a Public Service Medal, or PSM, for outstanding public service through the development of Australia's strategic and defence policy, particularly in the areas of Australian defence operations in East Timor, Iraq and Afghanistan. And in 2016, he was awarded the French Declaration of Knight in the National Order of Legion to Honour. Uh, you may, some of you who were, were, were at the C, re, recent uh, Royal Australian Navy Sea Power Conference in Sydney, uh, and it was, it was reported, I think, in the Australian, and certainly is online, that the Minister of Defence, the Honourable Senator uh, Reynolds, in referring to a new era of strategic composition po uh, facing Australia, posed three questions. What changes do we need to make to our strategy? What changes do we make, need to make to our capability? And the third one is how can we transform defence into an organisation that can deliver on the national task? Now, I'm not going to ask Peter to speak on the last one, although I'm sure he'll have quite a, uh, a, a, a detailed knowledge on that because I think we could be here for a week to talking about how he can transform defence. But it's timely uh, in the context of the Minister's discussions about changes we need to make to our strategy and to our capability that we have Peter Jennings, the Executive Director of ASPE, to talk to us today on does Australia need a plan B for its defence policy? Thank you. Well, Paul, thank you very much for that uh, introduction and uh, also, uh, Paul, for uh, showing me around this uh, lovely uh, new facility uh, that you have here associated with the memorial. Um, as a person who's spent a career um, working in Canberra on uh, strategic policy, I, I think it's very important for all of us to remember that the, the end point of strategic policy is uh, someone with a rifle on, on patrol. Um, and you always have to sort of, I think, understand the connection between uh, the, the higher end of setting the purposes of what our government asks our military to do um, and the practical experience of what soldiering means. And of course, if you come to a place uh, like the memorial, you, you, you see that very clearly. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I can tell you that um, this week, um, the uh, most important order of business for me um, is moving house. Um, I've, I'm quitting a house with my wife which we've been in for 25 years and um, I left her amid a chaos of boxes and um, everything. So I can tell you it is with great pleasure that I'm here uh, today and uh, in fact if you want to go for a few days to talk about defence policy that would be pretty convenient from my, my perspective. Um, <clears throat> so I've, I've taken as my theme, um, do we need a plan B? Um, and as Paul said, uh, um, we, we've sort of had a bit of a hint about um, where the government is thinking 
uh, on that very issue from uh, Linda Reynolds, the uh, Defence Minister, who was speaking at the Pacific Conference uh, in Sydney just a, a few weeks ago. And uh, what the Minister said was that there is work going on inside the Department to rethink Australia's um, strategic outlook. Um, and she said that the 2016 Defence White Paper, which is the last Defence White Paper um, issued in uh, February of that year, um, significantly underestimated the pace of strategic change. Um, now, I, I have sort of mixed um, feelings a little bit about that, that assessment because I was, uh, I was pretty closely involved in uh, the 2016 Defence White Paper. The, the government um, asked me to lead uh, what they called an external expert panel, uh, which was designed uh, primarily to annoy the Defence Department as they went through the process of putting the 2016 Defence White Paper together. But at the end of the day, I think in this business there is uh, no point sort of being sentimental about old documents. You, you need to move on. Uh, and I think that Linda Reynolds is um, absolutely right to say that we, um, in some respects, did underestimate how quickly things were changing and, and really changing for the worse um, in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, now, he, he, here's an interesting thing. Um, the, the government started the 2016 Defence White Paper actually at the beginning of 2014. It, it took about 20 months all told to produce. Um, and that 20 months was almost precisely um, the same amount of time that China took to effectively annex about 80% of the South China Sea, uh, which they did uh, by um, constructing um, on atolls three um, what, what have emerged to be quite large air bases. Um, and since those bases um, were uh, uh, completed, they have uh, added to them reinforced hangars, um, surface-to-air missile systems, uh, regular visits by the uh, People's Liberation Army, Air Force and Navy. So they have turned these things into um, uh, quite significant uh, military uh, fortifications. Now, at about the time uh, that Beijing was starting this, um, it said that the purpose of this construction was uh, well, they gave a number of reasons to facilitate tourism, uh, like, uh, you know, to uh, monitor the movements of sea turtles. Um, uh, but in fact, what was very clear from the beginning uh, was that there was a military purpose associated um, with uh, this construction. Um, President Xi Jinping went to Washington DC in September of 2015 and he actually gave a public promise at the time, uh, saying to Obama that China would not militarise the southern half of the South China Sea. But in fact, that is precisely what they've done. Um, now, it wasn't just us that was perhaps underestimating the seriousness of this development. Um, at the time, uh, the Obama administration took the view that um, whatever was going on, this wasn't worth putting into jeopardy the state of relations between Washington DC and Beijing over what um, Obama's uh, national security advisor of the day, Danny Russell, uh, said was just a bunch of rocks. Um, and so I think, um, you know, w w we fundamentally underestimated the strategic significance of what happened. Why? Because control of the South China Sea essentially means control of Southeast Asia. Uh, now, one of my sort of subtexts of the presentation that I'm giving today is, is really to say that everything old is new again, because if you ask yourself the question, why is China interested in the South China Sea, it's largely for the same reasons why Japan uh, in the 1930s thought that um, control of the South China Sea was essential to its interests as well. Japanese war plans um, at the time appreciated that they needed to be able to destroy what then was the British Navy uh, to prevent the British from being able to come from Singapore up through the South China Sea to threaten the Japanese homeland. Uh, the Japanese also realised that it was important to keep Southeast Asia weak uh, so that it was not potentially a threat to its interests 
and as a source for uh, a range of uh, raw materials. Now, I, I would argue Chinese objectives are similar. Um, they want to control air and sea movements towards their mainland through the South China Sea. Um, and they make the calculation that a weak Southeast Asia or a weak ASEAN um, benefits their interests because it's not there to compete with anything that Beijing might want. <clears throat> so I would say that um, in terms of control of the air, uh, Beijing has pretty much achieved that. Uh, in terms of being able to deliver a weak Southeast Asia, th they're well on the way. Now, go back to the 2016 Defence White Paper. If you, if you read that document carefully, um, what you will see is a, the government says the defence of Australia effectively begins in what they call maritime Southeast Asia. Um, and that is largely where the $195 billion worth of spending that was announced in the 2016 white paper is going. It's the, it's the, uh, the new submarines, it's the um, anti-submarine warfare frigates, um, it, it's a range of uh, air capabilities largely focused on being able to project Australian military force into what the white paper calls Maritime Southeast Asia. Now, last time I looked at the map, Maritime Southeast Asia is the South China Sea. Uh, and I do remember thinking at the time, back in uh, February when the government released this uh, white paper document, do they actually realise what they've signed up to? Uh, because on the face of it, you might say, well, here is now a potential contest of authority in um, a very important piece of geography. Um, did, they, did they know what they were signing up to? Uh, well, uh, uh, history will, will tell, but you know, I, <clears throat> worth uh, saying that in the course of the 2016 White Paper's production, we went through two Prime Ministers and we went through three Ministers for Defence. And of course, when you have that type of uh, change at top levels, you, you are always going to be dealing with, with governments that are learning the job rather than necessarily being deeply experienced. And their, their time uh, back then was sort of, back then it sounds like 50 years ago, but just a couple of years ago, the real focus of what government was doing was to focus on industry policy. So if you track the history of Tony Abbott, we went from a period where the government was saying, we will be buying equipment off the shelf. Right? Remember the Japanese submarines? Uh, we're not here to support industry policy. They, that was completely flipped in the space of about 18 months to we're going to create a sustainable strategic industry largely in Adelaide. And defence policy got sort of drawn into shaping well, what's the requirement of a sustainable strategic industry. Uh, you don't want to stop and start with ship production. You want to keep it going sort of sequentially. And for a country like Australia, what that means is that you slow down the rate of production. So it takes 18 months to build a submarine. But you're never out of work. You're always going to be building a submarine. So that was some of the sort of industry thinking that was behind the, the white paper. Um, really now, I think the challenge is to say, how do we deal with those much more immediate strategic risks uh, that are in play? And the government you know, has not been um, idle on this front. We've had through uh, the end of Malcolm Turnbull's time and uh, turbocharged with Scott Morrison, uh, the Pacific Step Up, which is a, a policy that's designed to say, not in so many words, but not being in government, I can uh, call a spade a spade. We're, we're, we're really concerned about the extent of Chinese undue influence in the Pacific Island region and so we are now going to reinvest in that part of the world. It's critical for our um, uh, strategic interests and so we have uh, the Pacific step up. Um, why is China interested in those small islands of the Pacific? Well yes it is about uh, resources, it's about fish, it's about hardwood timber from Melanesia and, and other resources but their real interest is strategic. And again, go back to the Second World War. Um, at the time in the Second World War, Japan understood that it was vitally important for it 
to complicate America's capacity to get American military forces over to the other side of the Pacific to fight the Japanese. And so one way you do that is you try to control as many of the islands in the Central Pacific and Melanesia as you can. That's the story of the, sec of the Pacific War. Um, China is thinking the same way. China understands that you complicate America's capacity to project military force towards their homeland if you control much of the islands of the Pacific uh, region. And so that explains why, for example, there has been significant Chinese interest in the idea of building a naval base in Vanuatu, uh, which uh, I can tell you um, was 100% uh, accurate in terms of uh, the media reporting about um, those feelers from Beijing going out to Port Vila to see uh, if such a facility could be constructed. And that um, sort of went off like um, a nuclear explosion in Canberra as people thought, my, my goodness, it's, it's, finally, it's finally arrived. We have to think about that. You know, the last time Australia was thinking about a threat from the east was the 1940s. Um, and I don't think we've seen the finish of uh, Chinese interests in uh, that part of the world. So, <clears throat> with that as background, what uh, does Plan B look like uh, for Australia? Um, and I think the, the first thing to say is, uh, regardless of uh, its ambitions and money, Plan B is going to look a lot like Plan A. Uh, there is not going to be a walking from our alliance relationship with the United States. Anyone that did a sort of an actuarial analysis of the value that we get from that would, would conclude that it's something very important to maintain. Um, and um, as I was just saying to uh, uh, some colleagues here, you, you can't turn an equipment acquisition program on a dime either. Uh, so, so there are going to be strong elements of continuity. But um, for the next few minutes, what I want to do is to focus on some of the things that could change or should change uh, in terms of a possible plan B and I've, I've got um, eight or nine things that I want to um, share with you that fall into that category. Um, so the first thing that I would like to do if I was uh, uh, involved in this uh, new uh, process would be to say our governments have to think of different ways of talking to the Australian public about China. Uh, right now we're in a sort of a don't mention the war uh, kind of phase uh, where you know a day or a week that goes by without um, using the C word um, is a day uh, or a week where we can sell them more iron ore, sell them coal, welcome their students to our universities and the, the government does not want to do anything which will reduce um, that enormously important economic relationship that um, has kept Australia wealthy for, for the better part of um, uh, uh, three, uh, three decades. But this is the truth of the matter. Um, China is a very different country to the sort of country we thought it was going to be when it signed up to the World Trade Organization a decade ago. I think people hoped that what was going to happen was that China would become a bit more like Singapore. Um, it wouldn't necessarily become a democracy, but it would open up, it would become more liberal, it would develop a free press, uh, an independent judiciary. None of that has happened. Uh, in fact, what has happened in China is that it is going back to its Leninist origins, or the Leninist origins of the Communist Party under the form of President Xi Jinping, who is often said now to be the most powerful Chinese president since Mao. Um, I think he's got a way to go to really get to that point. But what, what Xi has done uh, is that he has invested all of the resources of the Chinese state into strengthening the control of the Communist Party and strengthening his control of the Communist Party. Um, so um, I've said to a number of uh, defence friends of mine, uh, when I was in the Defence Department, uh, I hosted the visit to Australia of the most senior PLA general that had come to Australia to that point, a four-star general uh, vice chairman of the Central Military Commission called uh, Guo Bojong. Uh, Guo is now spending the rest of his life in jail. 
Um, and he's spending the rest of his life in jail on what I'm sure was um, absolutely uh, correct charges of corruption uh, in selling commissions for senior ranking officer positions in the PLA. Of course, they all do that in, in those ranks. Guo's real crime was to be an appointee of Zhang Zemin, who was the sort of factional opposite of uh, Xi Jinping. And uh, what Xi has done over the last five years has been to purge the military and it's been to purge the party to remove any source of potential opposition to him uh, as the supreme leader of China. Now, um, that, that will end badly, I assure you. There's, there's, um, I, I think history tells us that there's no uh, dictatorship of that type which sort of ends, ends happily. Um, but that might not yet be for five years or ten years, um, you know, who, who knows? That could be uh, Xi Jinping on the line uh, there. <laughs> this, their surveillance system is uh, very effective. Um, uh, so, uh, so we have an authoritarian China, um, which now just happens to be the country on which we have made ourselves economically dependent. How does government talk to the Australian population about that? We can't not have that conversation. So that's the first thing that I would change. Um, the next thing I'd do is we have to work out how we can strengthen the alliance with the United States as the same time as we protect ourselves from some of the more colourful uh, behaviour of the current American president. The US is the world's essential superpower. There's no getting away from that. It is the country which has been responsible for maintaining stability in the Asia-Pacific region since the end of the Second World War. And from my perspective, that makes it absolutely vital that we uh, remain uh, a, a strong ally of the United States. But Trump complicates things, right? Because he is compulsive, uh, because I think he has no grasp of geography or strategy or history, and he's not really personally committed to strong alliances. Uh, I think he thinks that they are things that just drain uh, American resources. Now, um, I've, I've recently, in, in some travel, been in, um, of all places, Canada and then Germany. And uh, what I can tell you is talking to um, uh, figures in those two countries, the, the depth of angst and anger about Trump is something that simply cannot be ignored. It is becoming a major, major problem to the stability of NATO and the future of that alliance system. Um, so it is anything but business as usual in terms of Western alliances. But what I'd say is um, it's not just about Trump. He, he adds a bit of sort of, you know, colour, a bit of um, soap opera to it. But if you actually look at the policies that uh, Barack Obama was pursuing, particularly in the last term of the Obama administration, he and Trump are pretty much on a unity ticket in terms of uh, America's approach <coughs> to uh, the Middle East, uh, in terms of America's expectations of the Allies, um, and indeed um, in many ways on, on dealing with China. So a critical question here is, you know, is Trump a, a sort of a cause or a symptom of this growth of a type of American um, isolationism? And again, to come back to my sub-theme, we've seen it all before, right? America of the 1930s was a very different country to America of the post-war era. Um, you know, the, the imminent defeat of the United Kingdom in mid-1940 uh, in the European war was not enough to get America into the Second World War. That took Pearl Harbor. So we've seen um, a, an America that is like this um, and therefore I, I don't think that we can uh, afford to take the alliance for granted. I think it's something which is going to take you know, significant investment um, and we have to recognise that it's going to be a different type of America and a different type of alliance. It's an America that is not particularly committed to the historical experience of what our two countries have done in a hundred years of mateship. Uh, it's an America which in terms of its own involvement in the world is going to be more selective and it's going to expect more of 
the Allies to uh, pull their own weight. Um, so on, on Trump, I would say um, so far we've been quite successful. We've not had any of the experience that the Canadians or the Europeans have had in terms of direct attacks from the president via tweets or uh, other means uh, that sort of show his contempt for alliance relations. I fear the day that that happens because I think that would change a lot of Australian thinking about the, the special relationship, but it, it hasn't happened yet. He seems to quite like us. Um, and so my view there is, well, we need to do more. We, we absolutely have to make sure that Washington uh, understands the point that we are an ally that um, significantly uh, uh, does more than our size would suggest and that they get value from that relationship just as we get value from that relationship. Um, I, I think the government gets this point of view. Um, uh, I think a good example of uh, doing things that work in the Washington context is something Scott Morrison did when he was in Washington a few weeks ago, which was to announce that Australia was actually going to spend a significant amount of money collaborating with NASA to uh, ensure that we will have um, a human beings uh, back on the moon by 2024 and to explore the idea of a permanent moon station uh, that will be designed to assist the move to Mars in terms of human flight uh, in the 20, early 2030s. Uh, now, you know, I think that there are, uh, what, what can Australia bring to this um, um, objective? Well, um, some very interesting things. Uh, if we're going to get to Mars, one of the things we'll need to do is mine resources from the moon. Uh, and so therefore there is an interest in um, extreme remote unmanned systems to engage in that uh, type of activity which it just so happens we're probably world's leaders on uh, in terms of mineral extraction from uh, the west and the north. So we can bring real substance to this table. Um, and, you know, I, I think, to, to me at least, um, and I hope to you, there is a sort of undeniable attraction to the idea of a joint project like that with the United States. Next thing I want to talk about is uh, that grubby issue of uh, defence spending and um, how much is enough. Uh, my view there is that it really is time that Canberra stopped high-fiving itself that we've now achieved close to spending 2% of gross national product on defence. Uh, that is taken now to be the benchmark figure of sort of adequacy for defence spending, at least amongst NATO countries. Um, but let me tell you, what 2% of gross national product buys in terms of Australian defence capability is pretty much what we have now. It does not buy us a future force that is modernised with artificial intelligence, that is modernised with um, a significant array of unmanned uh, systems, uh, with hypersonic weapons, in other words, the next generation of military technology. It buys us the best little done 60,000 person defence force that um, a country can have, sort of now and sort of out to 2040. But if we're going to do anything that goes beyond that rather um, boutique uh, sort of steady state level of capability, we are going to have to spend more money on defence. And I would remind you in the height of the Cold War, uh, we were spending about 3% of gross national product. Um, if we were spending 3% now rather than a shade below 2, that would add another $20 billion a year to the $40 billion defence budget that we currently have. So that's a big step up. Um, uh, and if you said, um, being a Canberra guy, you sort of try to plan out how would a government do that, you wouldn't get $20 billion in one go, you'd probably step up by $5 billion a year, something like that. That would give us, let's say, $50 billion extra to spend out to 2023. Nice. But not, it will not fundamentally change the shape of the Australian Defence Force. It, it would give us the capacity to buy a few more interesting things. Uh, it would give us the capacity to enhance a number of our existing systems. It's um, um, useful, but not necessarily completely transformative. 
Um, I, I think that we have no option but to do that. Uh, but there are um, other views, ladies and gentlemen, and, and in the interest of fairness, let me uh, uh, report to you what uh, my uh, good friend uh, Hugh White uh, says. Uh, Hugh has a book out, How to Defend Australia. Um, Hugh um, actually argues for a doubling of defence expenditure to roughly 4% of gross national product. But he's very interesting after that. He sort of says, well, you know, we also have another option, which is we could just give up. You know, we could just sort of free ride uh, and accept that, you know, kind of like a bit of a New Zealand strategy that, you know, hey, you know. And I sort of think to myself, well, is that right? So, so the, the aspiration of national sovereignty is 4% of gross national product. After that, we just give up. Really? Is that, is that the thinking? Uh, anyway, I, um, his book is available, 29.95, in um, uh, all good bookstores. Um, next thing we need to do is, um, I, I think, in, given this uncertainty over the United States, reach out to a range of international partners. And I would call this um, the Alliance of Decency. Um, it's, it's a group that you would expect. Japan, India, UK, France, Germany, Canada. There'll be a few others besides, but basically I'm talking about the consequential democracies. You know, those, those countries that have the same value systems that we do, that typically tend to be the ones that turn up to the party when there is some type of international stabilisation operation that needs to be done. I think there's a lot more that collectively, um, as a group of countries, we could do together. Uh, and I think the cost of not hanging together, as the old saying is, is that we'll hang, we'll hang separately if we don't find common interest. With all of those countries, the one that's going best uh, in terms of growth of new cooperation is Australia and Japan. And, and I think that is actually a great thing. Um, we, we will probably, within the next few years, have to start thinking about a new ANZUS, a new three-country three ANZUS, where Japan is actually the third, the third of those countries. Um, my, my next um, sort of bucket list for what I would like a new policy to focus on is um, adding more hitting power to the Australian Defence Force in, in the relatively short term. Um, and what I mean by that is I'm, I'm a little concerned that I don't think we're actually bringing enough uh, sort of high explosive onto target in terms of the ADF that we have currently today. Um, where China is putting its money is in developing weapons that um, have extreme range uh, and high quality hitting power. Uh, and I think that's really what we need to be thinking about in terms of add-ons to the um, uh, Australian Defence Force and capability. So what would I do? Um, here's five, five thoughts for you to think about. First, I would be thinking about acquiring cruise missiles. Cruise missiles uh, have a range of, in the order of 1,500 to uh, 1,600 kilometres. They're a fairly flexible weapon in the sense that you can actually um, fire them off a range of platforms, submarines, surface ships, aircraft. Um, uh, that would go a long way to extending the range of the uh, Defence Force if we had them and incidentally was part of the plan back in 2009 uh, under the, um, the Rudd government, interestingly enough. Secondly, I would join with the United States in a project which they currently have underway, which is to acquire uh, the next generation uh, bomber, the next generation bomber aircraft. Um, uh, and my model for saying why that is a useful thing to do is actually the much maligned but really rather excellent joint strike fighter. So um, some years ago our government took the decision to invest about $600 million into the development of the joint strike fighter. Um, and out of that has sprung a whole lot of valuable industry spin-offs. Um, we're, we're now producing well above that value in terms of uh, components for all of the joint strike fighter aircraft. We may be able to actually um, absorb the extra work which went to Turkey, but I think is unlikely to stay with uh, Turkey in terms of their participation in the project. So a similar investment into the future bomber would give us the industry benefit from it as well as an aircraft with a much greater range than anything we have in our inventory at the moment and really compensate for 
uh, the, um, the retirement of the F-111 strike bomber of, um, of a number of years ago. Um, third, we've got to upgrade um, to a high point of excellence the Collins class submarine. Uh, Collins has um, a largely unfair reputation that is I think probably the best conventional submarine operating in the world today and like it or not it is going to be the pointy end of our deterrent for at least a decade um, and so therefore skimping on upgrading it in order to save money for the future submarine does not make sense in terms of the current strategic outlook. Um, fourth, we need to spend more money on developing autonomous systems. Um, frankly, that is the way of the future as far as the, uh, all advanced militaries are concerned. But here what I'm thinking about is you don't necessarily have to put everything into Triton systems that are for maritime reconnaissance that cost hundreds of millions of dollars. <coughs> Excuse me. We, we need to be looking at relatively cheap systems uh, for land, sea and air. Um, and the way I think I would go about uh, developing those would be to create an Australian organisation which would be a bit like the American Defence Advanced Research Projects Organisation, DARPA. Okay, so DARPA invented GPS, DARPA invented stealth. Uh, it's actually quite a small organisation but with the remit to go and do stuff at the cutting edge of new technology. So we need an, an Aussie DARPA. Uh, that I would give an early project to, which would be around um, autonomous systems. Um, and finally, I think we need to, somewhat contrary to any of what I've just said, we need to look at reserve service um, in the Australian Defence Force. I'm thinking to myself, the last time our government had a really serious rethink of reserve service was about the early 1990s when uh, it created the Ready Reserve. And you just need to ask yourself, well, how has work changed since then? You know, um, how are the skills in the Australian workplace changed since that time? Are we actually targeting the people that we need? You know, why not a sort of a reserve service for cyber guys and girls with, you know, ponytails and earrings who probably would never think of uh, joining the ADF, but might really love the idea of being able to go from um, a regular sort of IT type position into cyber activities uh, into, uh, into the future. Okay, so um, how am I going for time? When do I need to wrap up? When you're ready. Uh, I'm not wrapping up quite yet, but I'm just saying, can I, can I do another five minutes or so? Or, um, uh, well, uh, you, it's question time or it's up to you. Let me just give you five quick minutes on uh, the other things. Um, firstly, people keep asking me what to do about the submarines. Uh, so I think that's a, a point that we could actually spend an entire day on. What I have written about publicly is that it's time to think about nuclear propulsion. Um, uh, because if you think about it, what we're doing right now is we are spending hundreds of millions of dollars to take a nuclear powered boat and make it less efficient by turning it into a conventional boat. Now does that make sense? Uh, in order for that to happen, we have to have a completely different conversation about um, uh, nuclear propulsion in Australia. Next point very quickly, what happens after Pacific step up? Uh, more Pacific step up, except this time government will have to spend money on it. So, so far all of the things that Scott Morrison has talked about in terms of Pacific Step Up have been absorbed by Canberra's departments on the existing spend. That, that is not going to be sustainable, so more money. Um, thirdly, we need a sort of a Southeast Asian version of the Pacific Step Up. Um, if China's interest is to have a Southeast Asia that's weak, I would argue that Australia's interest is to encourage a Southeast Asia that's strong. Um, and how you do that is by deepening our own engagement with the countries of Southeast Asia. So that will cost money. Um, and I just reinforce to you the point about um, how diplomatically we, we have been operating in our region on the smell of an oily rag for decades. So you might be in Singapore and see the Singapore High Commission there. I can tell you it's about half empty, you know, and that is true of all of our diplomatic representations of, uh, around the world. Uh, finally, and I, I, I will end um, here now, uh, nuclear weapons. Um, that's another question I get asked about. 
Um, again, my, my good buddy um, Hugh White sort of comes close to arguing that Australia should think about acquiring nuclear weapons in, in his book. Um, my own view on that is um, I would far prefer a system uh, whereby we subcontract that task to the United States. Uh, that, that is cheaper, it's effective, um, it's worked pretty well uh, since the 1950s. The idea of Australia having to uh, develop its own nuclear weapons capability I think is one that would frankly be beyond us. But I wouldn't rule it out altogether. I, I think it, it comes down completely to the shape of our region uh, and probably to, if you're looking for a sort of a tactical thing to watch, um, Indonesia's future political dispensation. You know, Indonesia happens to be now, I think, a relatively successful democracy on a path which makes them more of a partner than a competitor. But you know, if you could, you, if you could not rule out the risk of Indonesia going back to a sort of Sukarnoist, strongman type of rule. Um, and Indonesia that started to talk about developing intermediate range ballistic missiles would be an Indonesia that would have to think about very differently. So there's some uh, thoughts for you about um, a future uh, uh, policy challenge that um, our colleagues in Canberra face uh, right now. Um, I notice that uh, right now that, um, we're not supposed to call this a defence white paper that appears to be uh, uh, Prime Minister's call at this moment. <coughs> Don't be surprised if what happens as we get into the later uh, 2020 time frame is that, that this is what it turns into. I'll finish there. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you'll ask a question.